Chapter Three of the Daughter of the Commandant by Alexander Pushkin, translated by Mrs. Milne Home. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. The Little Fort. The Little Fort of Belogorsk lay about forty versts from Orenburg. From this town, the road followed along by the rugged banks of the river Yaik. The river was not yet frozen and its lead-colored waves looked almost black, contrasted with its white banks with snow. Before me stretched the Kyrgyz steppes. I was lost in thought, and my reverie was tinged with melancholy. Garrison life did not offer me much attraction. I tried to imagine what my future chief commandant Mironov would be like. I saw in my mind's eye a strict, morose old man, with no ideas beyond the service, and prepared to put me under arrest for the smallest trifle. Twilight was coming on. We were driving rather quickly. "'Is it far from here to the fort?' I asked the driver. "'Oh, you can see it from here,' replied he. I began looking all round, expecting to see high bastions, a wall, and a ditch. I saw nothing but a little village surrounded by a wooden palisade. On one side three or four haystacks covered with snow. On another a tumble-down windmill, whose sails, made of coarse lime-tree bark, hung idly down. "'But where is the fort?' I asked in surprise. "'There it is, yonder, to be sure,' rejoined the driver, pointing out to me the village which we had just reached. I noticed near the gateway an old iron cannon. The streets were narrow and crooked. Nearly all the izbas were thatched. I ordered him to take me to the commandant, and almost directly my kibitka stopped before a wooden house, built on a knoll near the church, which was also wood. No one came to meet me. From the steps I entered the anteroom. An old pensioner, seated on a table, was busy sewing a blue patch on the elbow of a green uniform. I begged him to announce me. "'Come in, my little father,' he said to me. "'We're all at home.' I went into a room, very clean, but furnished in a very homely manner. In one corner there stood a dresser with crockery on it. Against the wall hung, framed and glazed, an officer's commission. Around this were arranged some bark pictures, representing the taking of Kustrin and of Opchakov, the choice of the betrothed, and the burial of the cat by mice. Near the window sat an old woman wrapped in a shawl, her head tied up in a handkerchief. She was busy winding thread which a little old one-eyed man in his officer's uniform was holding on his outstretched hands. "'What do you want, my little father?' she said to me, continuing her employment. I answered that I had been ordered to join the service here, and that, therefore, I had hastened to report myself to the commandant. With these words I turned towards the little old one-eyed man whom I had taken for the commandant. But the good lady interrupted the speech with which I had prepared myself. "'Ivan Kuzmich is not at home,' she said. "'He has gone to see Father Garasim. "'But it's all the same. I am his wife. "'Be so good as to love us and take us into favor. "'Sit down, my little father.' She called a servant and bid her tell the Oryadnik to come. The little old man was looking curiously at me with one eye. "'Might I presume to ask you,' said he to me, "'in what regiment you have deigned to serve?' I satisfied his curiosity. "'And might I ask you,' continued he, "'why you have condescended to exchange from the guard into a garrison?' I replied that it was by the order of the authorities. "'Probably for conduct on becoming an officer of the guard,' rejoined my indefatigable questioner. "'Will you be so good enough to stop talking nonsense?' the wife of the commandant now said to him. "'You can see very well that this young man is tired from his journey. He has something else to do than answer your questions.' Hold your hands better. And you, my little father, she continued, turning to me, do not bemoan yourself too much, because you have been shoved into our little hole of a place. You are not the first, and you will not be the last. One may suffer, but one gets accustomed to it. For example, Shrabrin, Alexey Ivanitch, was transferred to us four years ago on account of a murder. Heaven knows what ill luck befell him. It happened one day he went out of the town with a lieutenant, and they had taken swords, and— they set to pinking one another, and like say, Ivanitch killed the lieutenant, and before a couple of witnesses, well, well, there's no heading ill luck. At this moment the Uryadnik, a young and handsome Cossack, came in. Maximich, the commandant's wife said to him, find a quarter for this officer, and a clean one. 
"'I obey, Vasily Igorovna," replied the Uryadnik. "'Ought not His Excellency to go to Ivan Polyaev?' "'You are doubting, Maximich," retorted the commandant's wife. "'Polyaev already has a little enough room, and besides, he is my gossip, and then he does not forget that we are his superiors. Take the gentleman. What is your name, my little father?' "'Pyotr Andreitch. "'Take Pyotr Andreitch to Simeon Kuzov's. "'The rascal let his horse get into my kitchen garden. "'Is everything in order, Maximich?' "'Look here, but all's quiet,' replied the Cossack. "'Only Corporal Prokhorov has been fighting in the bathhouse "'with the woman of Nogulina for a pail of hot water.' "'Ivan Ignatyitch,' said the commandant's wife to the little one-eyed man, "'you must decide between Prokhorov and Ustinya, "'which is to blame, and punish both of them, and you, Maximich.' "'Go, in heaven's name, Pyotr Andreitch. Maximich will take you to your lodging.' I took leave. The Uryadnik led me to an izba, which stood on the steep bank of the river, quite at the far end of the little fort. Half the izba was occupied by the family of Semyon Kuzov. The other half was given over to me. This half consisted of a tolerably clean room, divided in two by a partition. Sevelich began to unpack, and I looked out the narrow window— I saw, stretching out before me, a bare and dull step. On one side there stood some huts. Some fowls were wandering down the street. An old woman, standing on a doorstep, holding in her hand a trough, was calling to some pigs, the pigs replying by amicable grunts. And it was in such a country as this I was condemned to pass my youth. Overcome by bitter grief, I left the window and went to bed, supperless, in spite of Savilich's remonstrances who continued to repeat in a miserable tone, "'Oh, good heavens, he does not deign to eat anything. What would my mistress say if the child should fall ill?' On the morrow I had scarcely begun to dress before the door of my room opened and a young officer came in. He was undersized, but in spite of irregular features his bronzed face had a remarkably gay and lively expression. "'I beg your pardon,' he said to me in French, "'for coming thus unceremoniously to make your acquaintance.' I heard of your arrival yesterday, and the wish to see at last a human being took such possession of me that I could not resist any longer. You will understand that when you have been here for some time. I easily guessed that this was the officer sent away from the guard in consequence of the duel. We made acquaintance. Shvabrin was very witty. His conversation was lively and interesting. He described to me, with much raciness and gaiety, the commandant's family, the society of the fort, and, in short, all the country where my fate had led me. I was laughing heartily when the same pensioner, whom I had seen patching his uniform in the commandant's ante-room, came in with an invitation to dinner for me from Vasilisa Igorovna. Shvabrin said he should accompany me. As we drew near the commandant's house, we saw in the square about twenty little old pensioners, with long pigtails and three-cornered hats. They were drawn up in a line. Before them stood the commandant, a tall old man, still hale in a dressing-gown and a cotton nightcap. As soon as he perceived us, he came up, said a few pleasant words to me, and went back to the drill. We were going to stop and see the maneuvers, but he begged us to go at once to Vasilisa Igorovna's, promising to follow us directly. Here, said he, there's really nothing to see. Vasilisha Gorovna received us with simplicity and kindness, and treated me as if she had known me a long time. The pensioner and Palashka were laying the cloth. "'What possesses my Ivan Kuzmich today to drill his troops so long?' remarked the commandant's wife. "'Palashka, go and fetch him for dinner. And what can have become of Masha?' Hardly had she said the name than a young girl of sixteen came into the room. She had a fresh round face, and her hair was smoothly put back behind her ears, which were red with shyness and modesty. She did not please me very much at first sight. I looked at her with prejudice. Chivabrin had described Marya, the commandant's daughter, to me as being rather silly. She went and sat down in a corner, and began to sew, still as she had been brought in. Vasilisha Igorovna, not seeing her husband come back, sent Palashka for the second time to call him. Tell the master that the visitors are waiting, and the soup is getting cold. Thank heaven the drill will not run away. He will have plenty of time to shout as much as he likes. The commandant soon appeared, accompanied by the little old one-eyed man. What does all this mean, my little father? 
said his wife to him. Dinner has been ready a long time, and we cannot make you come. But don't you see, Vasilisa Yegorovna, replied Ivan Kuzmich, I was very busy drilling my little soldiers. Nonsense, replied she. That's only a boast. They're past service, and you don't know much about it. You should have stayed at home and said your prayers. That would have been much better for you. My dear guests, pray sit down to table. We took our places. Vasilisha Igorovna never ceased talking for a moment, and overwhelmed me with questions. Who were my parents? Were they alive? Where did they live, and what was their income? When she learnt that my father had three hundred serfs, Well, she exclaimed, there are rich people in the world. And as to us, my little father, we have, as to souls, only the servant girl Palashka. Well, thank heaven, we get along little by little. We have only one care in our minds. Masha, a girl who must be married. And what dowry has she got? A comb and two pence to pay for a bath twice a year. If only she could light on some honest man. If not, she must remain an old maid. I glanced at Maria Ivanovna. She had become quite red, and tears were rolling down, even into her plate. I was sorry for her, and I hastened to change the conversation. I have heard, I exclaimed, very much to the point, that the Bashkirs intend to attack your fort. Who told you that, my little father? replied Ivan Kuzmich. I heard it at Orenburg, replied I. That's all rubbish, said the commandant. We have not heard a word of it for ever so long. The Bashkir people have been thoroughly awed, and the Kyrgyz, too. They have had some good lessons. They won't dare to attack us, and if they venture to do so, I'll give them such a fight they won't stir for another ten years, at least. And you are not afraid, I continued, addressing the commandant's wife, to stay in a fort liable to such dangers? It's all a question of custom, my little father, answered she. It's twenty years ago now since we were transferred from the regiment here. You would never believe how frightened I used to be of those confounded bacons. If I ever chanced to see their hairy caps or hear their howls, believe me, my little father, I nearly died of it. And now I am so accustomed to it that I should not budge an inch if I was told the rascals were prowling all around the fort. Vasilisa Igorovna is a very brave lady, remarked Chivabrim gravely. Ivan Kuzmich knows something of that. Oh, yes, indeed, said Ivan Kuzmich. She is no coward. And Maria Ivanovna, I asked her mother, is she as bold as you? Masha, replied the lady. No, Masha is a coward. Till now she has never been able to hear a gun fire without trembling all over. It is two years ago now since Ivan Kuzmich took it in his head to fire his cannon on my birthday. She was so very frightened, the poor little dove, she nearly ran away into the other world. Since that day we have never fired that confounded cannon any more. We got up from the table. The commandant and his wife went to take their siesta, and I went to Schwabrin's quarters, where we passed the evening together. End of chapter 3 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com